the DI program really is about bringing more people to the table to have that access to opportunity and to your point, inclusivity to make sure that everybody, regardless of, of who they are, feel as if they can contribute, that they are, are that they matter in their organizations and that they're that they're needed and can do wonderful work in their particular organizations. Welcome to the HR LND podcast, where we explore cutting edge HR trends and best practices with top leaders who are shaping the future of work. My name is Nick Day, and I'm founder of JGA Recruitment Group, a specialist HR search firm. I'm also a qualified executive coach and a recognized HR thought leader listed on Thinkers360. Together, we're going to dive into topics from diversity and inclusion to technology, learning curation and employee experience to help you evolve your people and your development strategies. So whether you're a flourishing HR executive, a rising manager or a seasoned CHRO who's driving transformation, this podcast is for you. So grab your coffee and let's play. Hello and welcome back to the HR l and podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, and we are specialist HR recruiters. Now, if you're new to this show, please do remember to subscribe to it. Please share it with all of your HR and l and colleagues, and together we can raise the profile of the HR industry for everyone. And that's particularly important today because I've got not one, but two fantastic guests joining me to talk all about their book, but not just about their book. We're talking all about inclusive workplaces today. We're talking about diversity and inclusion. And I'm joined by Bertina uh, Ceccarelli and Suzanne Tedrick, who co-authored the best-selling book, Innovating for Diversity, which contains actionable and inspiring strategies for successful DEI outcomes through innovation. And this is something that's an absolute hot topic for HR professionals worldwide, and rightly it should be. Now, Bertina is on a mission to advance racial and gender equity in the tech industry and to disrupt the status quo to build a more inclusive workplace. As a CEO of npower.org, and I must just make this clear, that's not the npower in the UK, but actually a not-for-profit is one of the most successful not-for-profits actually in North America. She is committed to helping young adults and military connected individuals to launch tech careers and remove barriers to economic mobility. She was also named one of the tech industry's brightest superstars by US Black Engineer. Meanwhile, Suzanne Tedrick, a writer and speaker herself, she's dedicated to expanding the professional opportunities of women and people of colour within the tech industry. She's also the author of the critically acclaimed book, Women of Colour in Tech, which will be available in the show notes. So click straight through if you're interested in finding out more about that. And she's also a cloud computing technical trainer for a Fortune 500 technology company. Fiercely committed to increasing the participation of women and people of color in STEM professional opportunities, Suzanne has performed community service work for a number of nonprofits, including serv- servicing as the former chair of the Advancing Tech Talent and Diversity Executive Council for Comp TIA and coalition member for NPower's Command Shift Initiative. Suzanne was also the recipient of Comp TIA's inaugural Diversity and Technology Leadership Award in 2020. Now, for those, hopefully you're all familiar with STEM subjects, but if you're not, it stands for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But more importantly, we're going to be talking all about diversity and inclusion and innovative strategies for success. So without further ado, welcome, Suzanne, and welcome, Bertina, to the HR l and podcast. How are you feeling today? Terrific, Nick. It is so great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Insane. Super, Thank super you. stoked to get involved. I tell you what, I'm going to come to you with my first question, a question I ask all of my guests, which is this, and maybe I'll come to you, Bertina, to begin with. What do the words human resources mean to you? So, you know, look, when I think about human resources, two things come to mind. First, this is, I think, one of the single most strategic divisions within any organization, because it is the human capital that's going to fuel the success and growth of any company or nonprofit. The second thing I think about is, HR to me is the practice of identifying, recruiting, and developing human talent to the best potential in service of an organizational's organization's goals, and doing so in such a way that really honors the skills, aptitudes, and interests of that individual. And that is both art and science. Fantastic. Suzanne, what I think would that... you add? Yeah, is there Suzanne. anything you would add to that? Yeah, no, Bertina, that's, I think that's spot on. I think I want to re- also reemphasize the point about it's the, it's the lifeblood of, of a company. Uh, so many companies think that it's our 
technology, it's how we go to market, but all of these amazing things don't happen without people and great human resources, professionals and departments realize that there's so much of a, of an alchemy that goes into not only just finding great people, but really taking the best out of all of them uh, to help the organization to be successful. Uh, so I think human resources is, uh, to your point, Bertina, one of the most, if not most important uh, functions for any organization uh, today. Fabulous. What a wonderful start to the show. And it tells me that you fully understand the art of HR. And I think the leaders will be on the other end of this going, absolutely right. What a great start to the show. Well, listen, if I come to you, Suzanne, as someone who works every day to break down barriers uh, to social and economic mobility, someone who's passionate about um, giving, you know, diverse and inclusive opportunities to women in colour in particular in STEM subjects, what needs to be done to start to reframe the DIA dis- uh, DEI discussion to ensure that the initiatives that companies or HR leaders and professionals that listen to this show in particular have a lasting impact? Because we hear loads and loads of buzzwords about things that people are starting to do, but actually it's sometimes hard to really understand, Get lift the hood and go, what's actually working? How can we have a lasting impact? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of things that I, I think for leaders and especially HR leaders who are helping to developing programs, I think are important. And I think this emphasis getting beyond the looking for talent uh, in, in different places, but really getting to that piece on advancement and retention. What do I need to, now that I've got this great talent, how do I grow them out? How do I advance them? How do I get them to where they need to be, where they want to be in their careers? And how do I best, as a as an HR leader or leader in the organization, how do I best support that career path? And so it's getting beyond just the, the kind of surface level kind of approaches where, you know, we develop mentoring programs, which are fantastic, but really getting to the, the nitty gritty of, well, how do we get this person to the next level in their career? How do we give them opportunity, equity, pay equity, you know, et cetera? Uh, how do we really look at that career trajectory for the talent that we have uh, and really being intentional uh, about it? I think during the writing of uh, Innovating for Diversity, we we looked not only at just, you know, entry but what does it look like to keep and to retain? And I think one of the challenges that leaders sometimes have have is that they look at it, well, this is what I think people need versus reframing the conversation and asking people, what do you need? What can I do for you to help you to get to the next level? So I think kind of having that perspective shift, I think is necessary. So essentially, I I think um, potentially we're seeing a lot of HR initiatives then being kind of put into play without necessarily asking the employees or the workforces what it is they actually need in the first instance. And I guess that sometimes results in a kind of blanket approach that doesn't necessarily have the the impact they want it to. And if I come to you, Bettina, I wonder if you could share some of the principles of innovation which can be applied and you've seen work when it comes to building highly effective and sustainable DEI practices, particularly those that are then embraced and and taken on by the senior executives in organizations. I guess we kind of got to empower them first to to start that approach of then filtering that down. When we think about the principles of innovation, right there, we think about five key properties, courage, risk-taking, collaboration, trust, and leadership, which is really foundational to building a culture that supports innovation. And why is that important? It's important when we put it in the context of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because so often we're solving for the wrong problem. We think that by taking a checklist approach or, you know, we've got a certain formula of things that we know we need to do. We need to set up employee resource groups. We need to think about recruiting from different types of organizations. But unless you're really getting underneath the why and asking really hard questions, and applying an innovation lens to thinking creatively about how you're implementing, executing, measuring, monitoring, and being accountable for DEI practices, then it's going to be just that. It's going to be a formula. It's going to be check the box, and it's not going to work. This is what we know organizations do that 
fail at their DEI practices. And to your question about what can leaders do, leaders need to be focused on some of the root problems to their diversity challenges and focus on the systemic changes required within culture to make lasting difference. That makes sense. So I guess uh, if I'm just interpreting this correctly, and for me, this makes sense in my mind, a lot of leaders will often make uh, an assumption then of the fix that's needed without actually engaging the workforce. And then sometimes you can go down a rabbit hole with all the best intentions of the wo- in the world. But actually, if it's not the right action or the right thing for your workforce, and we understand that every work culture is different you know, across, across the world, but it's not always going to be the most um, effective or have the most impact. And I think the, 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 the statistics you highlighted there from the McKinsey report was absolutely right. So 97% think it works, only 40% feel it does. And that's a huge disparity, that number in the middle. So if we focus on that gap in the middle for a moment, um, I'll come back to you for a moment then, Suzanne. What are the most common reasons beyond what we've just highlighted there from Bettina that, that corporate DI programs are continuing to fail? It's really taking a step back and understanding people and, and where they are. So during the writing process, we, we actually focused on a specific chapter that talked about retention. And we, we saw in a study that essentially, you know, employers are putting out these, these typical benefits, these traditional benefits that, you know, we see in most places. So we see health insurance, we see uh, financial uh, services, assistance, and what have you. Uh, And in that same survey, they talked to employees about, you know, this is what I think would actually be the most impactful and the most helpful. So for example, many women and people of color, at least in the United States, take on a substantial amount of student loan debt to get their undergraduate or master's degrees to come into a workforce. And depending on the industry that you're going into, it's you're probably just treading water and just making enough to survive, let alone paying this massive amount of, of debt back. And so one of the things that they said would be helpful is, what are some of the ways that you can help me to tackle this debt? So I'm not constantly worried or for uh, older people who might be not only taking care of children, but they also might be taking care of ailing parents. So in terms of caregiver services, what are going to be some things that are going to be helpful for people who happen to be in those particular situations? So I think it's, again, really important to take that step back and and listen uh, about what is going to be meaningful ultimately for um, our particular employees and then crafting those programs in addition to not only mentoring, but benefits, making sure that they're they're helpful. Even things such as remote work. I, I know that for many companies, they're they're kind of making this, you know, unilateral mandate. We want you to return to the to the office. But does that always make sense to do if we've seen all of these productivity gains and people feel like they're they are bringing their best selves to work? It does beg the question that do we need to unilaterally just decide to do this or can we find some common ground for employees to feel like I can continue to do this while meeting leaders' needs? Sure, that makes sense. I think um, also, and I know I focused on the gap there and maybe that's um, a little bit uh, careless of me from one of the better word because actually for all the good intentions in the world, we shouldn't be implementing, in my opinion, DEI programs to be well-intentioned. We should do them because there's an absolute business case for doing this as well as anything else. Well-intentions are great, but actually that I think they can be limiting in terms of the amount of success we have if that's the only thing that's guiding it. But actually, for those that are unaware, listening to this show now, and all the studies I know back this up, but I'd rather come to you with the experts in your book, which obviously goes into this in great detail. What is the absolute core business case for diversity? Because I think this is something that people need to need to be awoken to. There's a lot of insight here, and we know insight leads to action. So if you can bring some of those insights to the table today, hopefully that'll help our HR leaders listening to this go, actually, this is not about intention. This is about doing the right thing for, for business reasons, as well as inclusive reasons and, and, and equitable reasons. Bettina, perhaps so, I come know, to you I, first. Yeah, I, I, would just, I would just maybe quickly say a couple of things. Um, you know, first, there's been a lot of talk around the business case. And, you know, on, on the one hand, it's absolutely critical that we have the numbers and the proof, right? That is what CEOs and, and that's what the market is going to look for. 
And that I think has been well documented, right? We know that in that companies that have diverse teams have higher productivity from innovation. We know sure. that companies that with diverse boards and diverse leadership teams outperform on uh, share again share price vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis their less diverse competitors. Uh, and we also know the changing demographic conditions in many countries around the world, you know, particularly as we look here at the U.S., recognizing that it is a business imperative. If a company wants to compete for the very best talent, they need to think very broadly about where they're searching for that talent. And that might that might be different kinds of institutions than what they've typically uh, relied on in the past. You know, we hear stories all the time of a uh, of a company that is recruiting from a, a handful of maybe five or six universities year in and year out because that's where the CEO and the top executives have gone, and it's propagating and perpetuating right a, a, a very a similar uh, look and feel to the workforce um, than those organizations that are being very intentional about recruiting from. 50 different sources that they've cultivated because they represent the, the depth and breadth of diversity they know works within their organization. So I think the business case, uh, while important, is not the only case. There's also a moral imperative um, to ensure, in, in, in my point of view, that there is uh, opportunity for economic development and growth um, for people across the economic spectrum. And as companies um, really ch make a choice intentionally to, to explore that, I think we're also seeing a broader viewpoint of what their customer base may be looking for in terms of services and products. I think, you know, Pepsi is one of the, the great examples um, where in looking at a range of socioeconomic uh, consumer categories, Globally, they've been able to land on a range of new products they never otherwise would have conceived of had they not really gone deep into their employee base to understand the possibilities. Sure, that's a great example. And I'm glad I asked the question. And it's that diversity of thought as well, of course, leads to more creative opportunities, such as the ones that you were highlighting there with Pepsi. So and actually, a coaching um, quote comes to mind when you're talking about that, Then, in terms of going to those five or six universities, which is now I'm a big believer in what got you here won't get you there. And if we want to be forward thinking organizations for the future, that is all about employee experience and inclusivity, which is actually what the, 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 the new workforce is looking for. And a lot of the career related decisions now are based on the values of the, an organization and how they how they support the you know, initiatives. It's absolutely paramount to, to an employee's decision now in the brands that they choose to work with. Actually, if we're not diverse in the way of doing those things, you might find it catches you out a lot later on. That's something that we see certainly on the recruitment side of things. And that choice now is much more in the power of the individuals, particularly while we're going through a, a talent shortage. So you have to be um, open to improving your, your, your awareness of DEI initiatives and, and improving what you do to, to be more inclusive, in my opinion. But for those that perhaps are fixed in their ways, if we want to disrupt some of those practices, we want to disrupt some of the fixed attitudes that does get in the way of change. What's the, what are some of the approaches we might be able to, to think about taking, uh, Suzanne? Yeah, so there's a there, there's definitely going to be people where when it comes to DEI, there's resistance for a, a number of, of different things. And so one of the, the approaches I tend to take is really taking, you know, what, what are the rationales and the reasoning behind some of this resistance and really breaking it down. So, for example, there are many people that feel that by virtue of having diversity, equity and inclusion programs, this might be necessarily taking something away from me. This might be taking away opportunity. This might be taking away space, which is, in my opinion, the furthest thing from the truth that a DEI program is supposed to do. A DEI program really is about bringing more people to the table to have that access to opportunity and, to your point, inclusivity to make sure that everybody, regardless of, of who they are, feel as if they can contribute, that they are, are that they matter in their organizations and that they're that they're needed and can do wonderful work in their particular organizations. Um, when it comes to conversations about, well, it's costly, it's costly to do diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
uh, I, you know, I looking at the statistics of how companies spend money on diversity, equity, and inclusion, I can see where people make those particular arguments. But it's really going back to our impact because you can spend a ton of money on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and have the same results. It's really about intentionality and really thinking about how do I include people? And so there are ways that don't necessarily require heavy investments. Uh, during the pandemic, I know that uh, Worldwide Technology, one of the uh, firms that we interviewed, they had listening tours. They had listening tours where people just had the opportunity to tell their stories and their perspectives. And so many people learn from just the honest dialogue and the honest conversations and learning about, well, how do I make my environments better for those around me now that I've I've heard this very powerful story. So it really is thinking about what is the the holdback, what is the the thing that's impeding people and, and really challenging them. Uh, you know, to, to kind of rethink and re- reframe how they have DEI in their minds. Yeah, I, I like that response. I think also um it brings to mind that maybe if we're looking at cost being a potential barrier, which you highlighted then, that it's very short term in 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 your way of thinking because actually the the biggest way to and I know this from my recruitment side right is if you've got a great reputation if you if your employees are speaking positively on whatever side that might be it's glass door whether it's word of mouth about your employer if you've created a psychologically safe space where they can be themselves and they don't without fear of retribution or judgment actually that that's one of the strongest things you can do to improve your brand to improve your ability to attract the top talent from competitors so it's it's it, for me it's the wrong way around thinking that cost is your barrier because actually if you invest in creating psychologically safe spaces and places where people feel included and and, and anyone is welcome then actually the brand builds on the back of that because word of mouth is one of the most powerful marketing tools there is and i personally don't see that changing regardless of the advancements in ai it's the, it's the people that work in that business that talk positively, that encourage others to come. And I know that in your book, you you, you talk about a number of uh, great case study examples. I wonder if you could bring a couple of those case studies. You mentioned Pepsi a moment ago with some of the great work they've been doing. But if I ask you to choose some of the ones that really, uh, I guess, cut, really come to the fore when you think about your book, that might just help um, the HR leaders listening to this to understand how they can, the benefits of getting their diversity strategies right. Um, that'd be wonderful. If I start perhaps with yourself, uh, Bettina. Yeah, so, you know, I think I might start with City. And, you know, there's a couple of things out of the City case study that's featured in the book that really struck me as a series of best practices. And, you know, going back to Suzanne's point, practices that didn't necessarily have to cost, uh, you know, an enormous amount of money. And I, the first I would just say is their utilization of employee resource groups. Now, we've talked to some companies where uh, leaders themselves would say, you know, we haven't really gotten very good at uh, uh, triggering productivity from ERGs. You know, they're sort of social groups. And those ERG leaders themselves would say, yeah, we haven't really kind of figured out what the mechanism here is to unlock uh, uh, the kind of ideation that we need to, across the organization, improve our DEI practices. But City um, has a, a veterans uh, resource group, uh, you know, for those who have served in, in the US military. And one of the things that was really profound in that group, they realized that the underlying core problem they wanted to solve is how to attract and retain more veteran talent. And that group put together a really remarkable guide that ended up becoming their Pathfinders program that led to a series of uh, uh, mentoring projects. Uh, They have a program called Battle Buddies where new veterans coming into the organization are, are signed uh, seasoned staff veteran, veteran uh, st- seasoned staff members who are also veterans, uh, and just a series of kind of cultural integration moments, where with a very big, large, complex organization, uh, they get introduced to what are some of the cultural norms at this company, and it's been hugely successful in uh, what they set out to do is really, you know, attract and retain veteran talent within their tech sector, within their tech stack. Uh, the other thing that that I would say City did and that we documented this case study is invent an apprenticeship program that has been wildly successful. And they were growing very, very quickly uh, just outside of uh, Dallas, Texas. They've got a large, large operation 
where many of their tech operations are housed. As you know, the market for tech talent is fiercely competitive. And they made the decision, we're going to open up our aperture a little bit and really begin to think about how can we recruit from new sources? And we know that the veteran talent source is one pipeline that we want to dive more deeply into. So they created this apprenticeship program where they sourced um, veteran talent and often individuals who might be in the enlisted ranks. Uh, Some may not have necessarily had a college degree, uh, but, you know, worked with our organization, Empower, and used that apprenticeship period, which I know in the UK is a model that, you know, is is roundly used. But in the U.S. is is not as commonly deployed, particularly in technology. But during the year of the on-the-job training, individuals learned a lot of the detailed uh, technology skills required to be successful within the company, 97% of those apprentices converted. And these are individuals that would not normally have made it through the HR screen had they gone through the regular recruitment process, but are now at the company two, five, eight years in and performing incredibly well. And so it's just a creative approach of a, a flavor of innovation that has really opened up new doors for new talent. And oh, by the way, really helping to expand and accelerate economic mobility for these individuals who served their country. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? Please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Love that example. And I don't, in the UK, certainly is something that um, slightly different, perhaps to to the scale of the, the, the results of the project you found. But w- I believe, and we've done this in our own organization, we're only 28 employees. And actually one of the best ways to to improve your 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 diversity or your approach diversity, equity and inclusion is actually to have advocates within your own company. But rather for me to choose them as CEO, I just went to my company and said, who would like to be in a committee that's focused on sustainability, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and basically improving our business? And we've talked, we've covered issues from the menopause all the way through to neurodivergency and other things to make sure that we are more inclusive and people feel safer at work. And I was really surprised. So I offered this out and I said, I'm not going to be part of this group quite deliberately as CEO. I'm going to leave this to you. Who would like to be part of it? Just shy of 30% of the entire workforce said they wanted to be in this community to talk about these issues. And I think it's quite interesting because if you don't have often, and, and um, I would love to get your, your, your view on this, often we feel like we can't set these advocacy groups up unless we have someone that's representative of the group we're trying to support. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. Anyone can be an advocate. A lot of people are passionate about these subject areas. If we don't ask our workforce We'll never know. And in the city example, obviously the veterans were straight away up front and said, Let, we're happy to take a lead on this. And the results have been profound. And if more companies took the opportunity to ask their employees who's passionate, who wants to have a voice, who wants to meet regularly and will give you some empowerment to, for the decisions you make to try and make those things happen. It can be amazing, in my opinion, how much of an impact that can have. Um, if I bring that to, to yourself, Zan, what are some of the, the case studies that really resonated with you in your book that perhaps be really good for our HR leaders to, to hear about? Yeah, uh, I mean, we were fortunate for the the stories that we we were able to highlight and the people that we were able to talk to. I think the one that sticks out the most for me for for several of the reasons that uh, you brought up and, and Bertina as well uh, was the Wesh company based out in Arkansas. And so in this particular case study, we have a a family owned business, a small family owned business in uh, Arkansas uh, that the their son was taking over as a president. And not only did he recognize the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but he made it very personal. Uh, He had the opportunity to participate in Teach for America uh, in a rural part of the United States. 
And he saw, you know, the, the differences and the disparities uh, that tend to happen with certain groups. And so once he became the leader of the organization, he really wanted to step forth and make DEI part and ingrained in the particular business. And with small businesses, it's not as if they have a ton of resources at their disposal. In Arkansas, it's a, a fairly homogenous uh, community and society. And so, the, so there's some inherent barriers and challenges, but nonetheless, uh, the leader, Jacob, had the opportunity to reach out to local resources that not only helped him to develop a program, but gave check-ins, um, talked about some pretty difficult DEI you know, discussions and topics, and then what DEI would specifically look like for or his organization. I think to the point that you made earlier, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to have representation from a particular group. It's more about having that empathy and caring and wanting to make a difference. And so, as you mentioned, he, Jacob also just asked his employees, you know, do you want to be part of this? Do you want to be part of this initiative? And, and they tried different things. Um, and I, I think that's applaud to be applauded because sometimes there's a, um, a trepidation, a fear of trying something different, trying something new, especially if it hasn't been established. And when it comes to DI, if it's not executed well, there could be some unintended consequences. But I am also of the belief that to get to, you know, better, you know, we have to keep iterating and we have to keep trying and doing new things. And so Jacob and his company had that opportunity to just keep iterating, learning from each experience, learning from those programs. Um, and so their program really isn't a, an evolution and it is a work in progress, as I think all DEI programs are at their heart. Sure. Um, so being able to highlight that story, I think, was um, very inspiring and very powerful. Yeah, I mean, what I love to hear about that is that he reached out to the local communities, he used the word homogenous. And, um, you know, as a talent and recruitment expert here, or something I'll speak to my clients about is, Things like LinkedIn, we think is the answer to all talent problems that we have. I certainly do in the UK, but actually even just by using that tool and you, if you only rely on one tool, then you have a homogenous approach to recruitment because there are certain types of people and characteristics that we'll share just by being on that platform. And there'll be people there for, for whatever reason, maybe socioeconomic or, or other reasons, they just don't like being in the social in the social space or sphere, but they're not on that platform and they're completely then missed out in a, in a, in a, in a recruitment process. But reaching out to local communities in that example is just one way of many that actually says to says to the, that company they can find people is passionate about the local community can find people outside of the homogenous resources that sometimes we get too lazy with really in the way that we recruit and attract staff um so i really like i really um enjoyed you mentioning that word and bringing up the approach of that that reaching out to local communities which i think a lot of businesses could learn from so it's a great example so tell us a little bit more about your your wonderful book, um, Innovating for Diversity. It does contain actionable and inspiring strategies for, for successful DEI outcomes, which is what our HR leaders on the show that listeners uh, are trying to achieve. I wonder if you could just bring the book to life and tell us a little bit more about what they can learn through the book. Perhaps I'll start with you, Bettina. So fundamentally, this is a book about what, what I see as the leaders who are courageous enough to say, I think there is something different that we can do. And if I just go back to city for a moment, right, I think about Dan Maslowski, right, himself a veteran, himself who had kind of a hard knocks background. And when he became a leader and in a position of authority uh, to hire uh, numerous individuals uh, within the cloud storage uh, uh, division of City, he said, I want to take a different approach, right? And he partnered with an HR business leader to uh, create what became this apprenticeship program. I think about uh, Andrew Parlock at Northrop Grumman and, you know, his story of saying, you know, we've long had this requirement for college degrees, and yet I've had this experience of working with some really bright minds through this nonprofit. And I'd like to bring some individuals in to really tackle a very, very challenging cybersecurity issue for a major client. And I need to work differently within the system to create a different category of employment so that I can bring in a different category of talent that's going to look very differently from those that we have typically brought into this organization. Um, these are the kinds of leaders who have been brave enough to say, I'm going to challenge the status quo. 
Um, and it might start small, right? So I would say one very practical lesson that we feature in the book is the power of pilots. And we know that any big idea, right, that is underpinned by innovation doesn't just happen overnight. It's a series of iterations of trying something new, of improving and getting better and bringing the idea to a level of perfection where, you know, now I can scale this. And so throughout each chapter of the book, whether it's Zendesk and mentoring uh, or Target and what they're doing around uh, retention of diverse talent, it's try new ideas, often not necessarily led by the HR department, a you know member of the C-suite, but a middle manager who has said, I think uh, I have an idea that's going to change how we think about any one of these aspects that's going to influence our DEI and therefore influence our entire culture. And those are the ideas worth paying attention to, listening to, trialing, piloting, and scaling when they work. Fantastic. I have to say the book, for those, uh, there will be a link in the show notes for those who want to access the book uh, straight away. You can find out more. There's also a website, which is innovatingfordiversity.com, which I'll link to in the show notes as well. But sure enough, it, it, it gives loads of examples of really committed leaders who are driving change towards more diverse and inclusive workforces, which is fantastic. And you need that commitment, as you say, at any level, if you want to drive through change. But if, if I'm an HR leader now and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm committed. I want to start this the right way, uh, even if it means throwing out everything I've done before, but just starting a fresh blank canvas. Suzanne, what, what, what would you recommend? Where do we start? From? Where, where should be the correct starting point for a successful DEI um, approach that's going to, I guess, have an, the impact that we're trying to achieve? I think that the best starting approach is not going it alone. I think that, uh, I think to Bertina, what she said earlier, and some of the things that we talked about before is that sometimes part of the problem is that the DEI programs are created in this silo, and it's usually going to be in, in human resources. And that's usually where we see perhaps some misalignment in strategies or not the execution that we would think. Uh, for DEI to work, um, in, in my humble opinion, it takes everybody. It takes beyond HR. It takes not just leaders. It takes everybody within the organization to understand that we are all contributing to this and it is imperative that we that we do. And so I would strongly suggest for human resources leaders to work with leaders outside of their particular uh, offices or domains, talk to people in sales, talk to people in product development. Uh, really get that leadership buy-in across uh, the organization because that's what's going to help to set the, the foundation for success. Because you may learn some things that you didn't already you didn't already know. Maybe the sales director probably is very committed uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and maybe has some ideas that might be helpful. Or maybe talking to other leaders, you may discover that perhaps their understanding of DEI. Uh, is not as far along as you as you as you think they are, uh, and so getting that buy-in, getting that alignment from the start, uh, I think is a, a critical piece for any DEI program to be successful. Fabulous. And, and from yourself, uh, Bettina, when you were researching for the book, obviously there's a number of case studies and great leaders that you feature. They're doing great work. What was the the one bit of research that perhaps surprised you when you were preparing and 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 creating the the book? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I reflected quite a bit on is the role of the CEO, uh, because, you know, we've seen, particularly here in the U.S., you know, lots of announcements that have been proclaimed by CEOs around commitments to diversity. And that's all great. And what we've learned in so many of the interviews and conversations that we had is that visible vocal support from the CEO is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. And this sort of builds on what Suzanne was saying about the role of, of middle managers within an organization and HR is that unless you've got the operational characteristics all the way through the organization to support DEI practices, it's going to fail. So, and we see this all the time in so many of the kind of proclamations that a CEO might make. It's like, well, because I've said it, it's got to happen. 
But we also know there are so many calcified processes within an organization that have been so deeply rooted, they almost become invisible. And it's oftentimes people who might be new to the organization or a manager at a department that may not be consulted so much on these kinds of issues where the ahas come from. And that might be perhaps how AI is deployed in recruitment. It might be what the interview questions look like within a company. It may be the promotional process, right? All of these things taking a very, very fresh look and bringing a new set of eyes and a new level of clarity and creativity to say, if we're going to make this big goal the CEO has just come out with around our DEI uh, objectives, let's really break down and give some original thought to what we need to change. And then let's invite a broad set of, organ of individuals across the organization to help us imagine what that change can look like. Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, it's the idea as well. I think you, you mentioned upon it earlier, but it's um, it's the journey, not necessarily the destination. The destination is ever moving. But if we continue that journey of best practice and asking questions, then we're going to get a little bit more successful each time. And I think you mentioned earlier about it, it's very difficult just coming from the CEO, because we know there's micro cultures in every business. And I can tell you the culture of my company, but it only takes one manager who's leading it a different way to change that culture. And the individuals in that particular team are going to feel very different to the way that I believe our, our company is. So that's why it's, you know, we've always got to be educating and learning and teaching. And um, from yourself, um, Suzanne, what's the, what's the question I haven't asked that actually relates to DEI, but the HR professionals, leaders, directors, business owners, entrepreneurs that perhaps listen to the show could really learn from um obviously i've tried to prepare questions i think are relevant based on the, the, the excellent book you've written but there might be something there that's quite profound that i haven't asked yet there might just be really you know an aha moment as i think uh, Batina, uh, Batina mentioned a minute ago oh that's a that's a great question um so i always kind of look at the imperative about doing uh work in dei and making changes in programs um, and having to be success successful with them is really thinking about what's at risk if we if we don't decide to to be it serious and intentional um about DEI. You you mentioned some great points earlier, the fact that for younger employees, this is a this is a non-starter. You need to be able to have inclusive environments that promote belonging. Uh, for many other people, there's the the element again about do I want to stay with an organization that makes me high portions of myself or doesn't value me? Or do I want to go and uh, be able to really feel like I'm contributing? I belong thinking about it from a product and service development, as Bertina talked about earlier, uh, having groups of people who come from similar backgrounds and similar makeups, you'll make certain types of products but you could be alienating so many people, so many missed opportunities for market share, so many missed opportunities for product innovation. And if we're not careful, um, you know, continuing to marginalize certain populations. So when I think to HR leaders and leaders in, in general, I, I really stress the urgency uh, about doing it uh, because there's always going to be a reason why you might fo not focus on a, a DEI initiative or why you might put something off. Uh, it's always about if I'm saying no to this now, what am I ultimately saying yes to in the, in the process? And what do I ultimately stand to lose if I don't take this, you know, more intentionally and more seriously? Yeah, that's a great point. I love the idea of well, when you say no, what are you saying yes to? But also when you're saying yes, what are you saying no to? It works both ways and just reevaluating things. I think, you know, as uh, myself, a, a, a Caucasian, middle-aged uh, white male, I know it, it, sometimes there's a fear that we're going to get it wrong. But I, I think you've mentioned the word a few times during today's show. It's about being intentional. It's about trying. And, you know, we use the Michael Jordan reference, which I love, where he missed more baskets than anybody else. But he practiced more and he tried and became the best, you know, shooter that has probably ever lived in the in the world of basketball. But you've got to sometimes put yourself out there and be willing to take take risk if they, if they, if they're well intentioned and you're trying to do the right thing. We hopefully shows like today will really help educate our audience to make sure they're taking the steps in the right direction, which is really important. But we know all the metrics, all the studies from McKinsey to PwC and beyond tell us that the more diverse our boards, 
the more effective our business is. The more we we can belong at work, taking it to that stage, the more productive and 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 we want to be as as employees. The more we feel connected to our employers, the better work and the more committed we want to do in, in return. So it kind of works on so many levels. Um, for those that want to find out more, I cannot recommend your book enough. So it's Innovating for Diversity. Of course, there will be a link directly in the show notes. Do please check it out. Some amazing case study examples. If you're a business leader or an HR leader and you want to follow some of the practices that other committed leaders have followed, you can find those case study examples in great detail in that book as well. And obviously it brings to life some of the examples mentioned on today's show. So very briefly, I'm going to open the HR L&D vault. And I'm going to, if I can, it's a wonderful opportunity for me. I'm going to ask you both these questions. Uh, they're short, sharp answers, three questions. The first is this. Uh, if I start with yourself, Fatina, if you could give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Don't give up. DEI is a hard, it's a it's a hard practice and it's easy to say, hmm, the things that we're doing aren't working and to step back. But if you think about that innovative cycle that requires a focus on constant improvement and you find something that's not quite working, you adjust, you course correct, you move on, but you don't give up. Keep at it. Love that. How about yourself, Suzanne? Oh, Bertina, you took my answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, if I had to go, it's always keep own your education. DEI changes so rapidly and so quickly. And so spending the time to invest in your education, to invest in your knowledge is going to be crucial, whether you are a DEI practitioner or a DEI advocate. So always keep learning. Fantastic. Great example. Second question. If you had the opportunity, what advice would you give to a younger you just starting out in this new world of work? And I'll start with yourself, Suzanne. Uh, basically that I belong. I, I really had uh, imposter syndrome and, and, and certain things that held me back from my my true potential, realizing that I'm just as smart and I'm just as great as everybody else that's here at you know the table. Uh, and so really owning my greatness, I think was something that I really wish I would have done 20 years ago. What a great response. I love that. And it brings to mind for me is that we're the thinker, not the thought. And um, I going bring back to your point as well. A, a moment ago is uh, sometimes we think we have a reality. In reality, we have a thinking problem. And it's just mixing those things up. But yeah, fantastic. What a great example. And how about yourself, Martina? I, I think, you know, and I love Suzanne's response. Um, I, and I think building on just having more confidence to take more career risks. I think I probably put myself in a box more often than I needed to rather than really thinking beyond and what potential might exist, um, exploring different paths, but you know, taking maybe at times too much of a safe route. Fantastic. And my last question, and of course I have two award-winning leaders in front of me here, which is fantastic, but what's the guiding principle behavior you've seen in every great leader that you've worked with? And I'll start with you, Bettina. Being focused on values, 100% of the time, really not just having values as an organizational manifesto or words on a website, but really truly living those values every single day as a leader and making it a requirement that that leader's senior staff exhibit those same values day in and day out uh, that really begins to build the culture from the top and throughout the entire organization. And that means sometimes if you need to counsel out individuals who might be great performers but fall short on the values that that is always going to be the right course of action love that what a powerful response how about yourself suzanne for me it's empathy i think that for any leader that takes on the mantle it starts becoming less about your success and more about the success of those around you and what it takes to get to that uh, point for your employees so really taking a step back and asking the question, what can I do to help you be successful in this job, in your career, um, and really leaning into the, the getting to love and know people. Uh, so I think empathy is a, a minimum requirement for all modern leaders. Yeah, a very popular response on this show as well. Empathy, kindness, two very popular responses, but I love the values one as well. And actually, if, if 
often it's just about living your true self as a CEO. Often your own values are enough. Don't try and change who you are because usually we all want, well, I'd like to think most leaders who are managing organizations want to be inclusive and want to do the best they can by their employees. And sometimes we get we get sidetracked when we don't need to be. So I have two fantastic responses. Uh, of course, for those that do want to find out more, I'll mention it just one more time, innovatingfordiversity.com. You can find a lot more information about the book there. I'll put a link to Innov- Innovating for Diversity, uh, the book on Amazon, but also I'll put a link to Suzanne's wonderful book, Women of Color in Tech. For those who want to find out more about that, it's a best-selling uh, book as well. Uh, I'll put a link to npower.org. And just to remind everyone, that's not the NPower we know in the UK, a very different organization, a not-for-profit. So please do check that out as well. Fantastic. And of course, if you're an HR L&D professional listening to this podcast, you need support with your talent uh, vacancy or vacancies, you need some specialist talent, please do get in touch with myself or any of my wonderful team at jgarecruitment.com. And that link will also be in the show notes. Just leaves me to say a huge thank you once again uh, to both uh, Bateni Ciaccarelli and also to um, Suzanne Tedrick for joining me today on the HR L&D podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure and a fantastic journey through DE and I. I hope it's been incredibly useful for those listening out there. Uh, start now. That's it for today's episode of the HR L&D podcast. I hope you found this discussion informative and thought-provoking and that it gave you actionable insights to help you drive your HR agenda forward. Please remember to subscribe to the show so you never miss a future episode. And I'd also love to hear from you. So if you enjoyed this show, please do leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. Your feedback helps me to ensure I can continue to bring you the topics and guests that matter most to you. Oh, and don't forget to share this show with your colleagues and fellow HR leaders as well. The more we spread the word, the more we can grow our community of HR professionals who I know are all as dedicated to driving the future of work forward as I am. Thanks, of course, for tuning in. My name is Nick Gay. Please do look me up on LinkedIn and send me a connection request. It would be great to get connected. In the meantime, I look forward to bringing you the next episode of the HR L&D podcast real soon.